Mother Teresa, Our Lady of Corpus Christi, and the Knights of Columbus. What do they have in common? And hello, I'm Gary Hall, and this is the Admiral's Almanac. After Thanksgiving, I had the opportunity to go to Our Lady of Corpus Christi and meet with Father Jim Kelleher. We had breakfast together, and after that fruitful conversation, I said, hey, let's go back to your office and record this podcast. So here we go. Let's see what Father Jim Kelleher has to say. I'm Gary Hall, your host of the Admiral's Almanac. And once again, I'm in Corpus Christi with Father James Kelleher, the Rosary Priest. By the way, he's one of our number one downloaded uh, episodes. We have two other episodes of them. So, Father Kelleher, how are you today? Doing great, Gary. It's great to be here with you at Our Lady of Corpus Christi. So, Father and I, we were just... uh, I was down in Corpus Christi for Thanksgiving, thought I'd meet up with Father Jim and buy him breakfast. We're back, and we said, let's do a little recording. So, Father, tell me a little bit. You're uh, from the Order of Salt. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure, Gary. Salt is the acronym for Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, and that's a a Society of Apostolic Life um, founded by Father James Flanagan in July 16th, 1958 in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, New Mexico. So the vision of the society is to bring all peoples into union with the Most Holy Trinity. And we do that by um, uh, the members of our society. We have priests, sisters, and lay people working together um, living Marian Trinitarian communion on, and we serve on ecclesial teams, you know, uh, in areas of deepest apostolic need at the request of bishops. So Father Flanagan, our founder, he was a diocesan priest in Boston. And at the age of 35, he got permission from Cardinal Cushing in Boston uh, to found the society. And Cardinal Cushing had a sense of humor. He said, Father Jim, I'm going to give you permission to do this, but don't stay in Boston. We just suffocate you. Go out west where you'll have some room to run. And so uh, Father Flanagan found this very good Irish-born bishop, Archbishop uh, Edwin Byrne. And um, he gave Father Flanagan the permission to found the society in the northern part of the state of New Mexico, up in the Mora Valley, which is about 8,000 feet above sea level. And... uh, uh, it was just a small little town uh, called Mora with a, about a thousand people there. And mm-hmm. that's where we got our start. All right. So how did you wind up here in Corpus Christi? And I have to say that if you're a Catholic or even if you're not a Catholic, if you're of Christian faith and you are traveling to Corpus Christi, I think Our Lady of Corpus Christi is a must stop. It's a pilgrimage uh, site. So tell us yes. a little bit about Our Lady of Corpus Christi here. Okay. Well, the way we landed in Corpus Christi was um, in 1989, Bishop Rene Gracida invited Father Flanagan to bring the Society of Our Lady here uh, to his diocese, where in the early phases of a new Society of Apostolic Life, you're, you have to have the permission of a bishop to operate in a diocese, and but you, you're seeking an approval called approval to be... Um, a society of apostolic life of diocesan right. And what that means, that's a combination of the diocesan bishop and the Vatican approving you to have permanent status in that diocese so that when bishops change, a new bishop can't come in and say, you have to leave. You know, you, you get to stay when, when the bishops change. And then, so uh, Bishop Grisita, Rene Grisita, he loved the work we were doing, especially with the migrants. And so, he said, Father, I'll get you approved um, as diocesan right. And that's what he did. And that happened in uh, 1994. We got approved as diocesan right. And now we have our um, application sitting on the desks in the Vatican for uh, to get pontifical approval. Yeah, to get pontifical approval. 
So uh, tell tell me about this beautiful uh, church we have here. Yeah, well, what happened, Gary, was um, way back in 1998, the Bishop of Corpus Christi at that time was Bishop Roberto Gonzalez. He was a Franciscan from Boston who was made bishop here in 1997. And essentially, to make a short story, he gifted a, a former retreat center to us to found a little college. And so we founded a little college called Our Lady of Corpus Christi. And and Father Flanagan was the f- uh, founding uh, head of the um, board of directors, and I was the president. Father Tony Anderson was the vice president, but we needed, they just had a small chapel here, so we needed to build a bigger chapel. And well, that chap, this chapel is amazing, and I will tell our listeners it was your brainchild. And so uh, I would think that the Holy Spirit uh, inspired you. Would that be correct? Yeah, I give all the credit to the Holy Spirit because. I, I like to pray to the Holy Spirit, and uh, one day I just sort of began thinking about the need for a bigger chapel, and the Holy Spirit just sort of gave me a vision that went like this. It was sort of a simple description. It was to build um, a world-class chapel of perpetual adoration built in the shape of a cross with a 75-foot blue dome with gold stars for Our Lady of Guadalupe Star of the New Evangelization. It'd be Spanish colonial architecture and hold 250 people. Well, that's a that's a great vision, but I, I, to accomplish anything, you have to have a detailed vision like that so you can communicate it to others. So this, uh, so praying to the Holy Spirit, how, how can we best pray to the Holy Spirit? Why don't you okay. uh, help me out there? All right, Gary. Well, um, when I was doing a doctoral dissertation in Rome, um, I realized that this was a huge project and Anybody that has ever done a doctorate will usually tell you, don't go and try to do it because (laughs) it's an epic journey usually. So I came across this prayer to the Holy Spirit and I began praying it as I did this doctorate. Well, the Holy Spirit got me to successfully through the dissertation and defending it. And so I pray this prayer a lot. And when I pray with a group, Gary, I like to do it in echo format where I say a phrase and the other people repeat it. Because I like to say, when I'm speaking, they're listening to the Holy Spirit. When they're speaking, I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. And I really have found through experience that the Holy Spirit does speak to all of us, and He, he puts ideas in our mind that guide us. So, should we try? Should we try that? Uh, yeah, let's try that. So, in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit. Soul of my soul. Soul of my soul. I worship and adore you. I worship and adore you. Enlighten and guide. Enlighten and guide. Strengthen and console me. Strengthen and console me. Tell me what I ought to do. Tell me what I ought to do. And command me to do it. And command me to do it. I promise to be submissive. I promise to be submissive. In everything you permit to happen to me. In everything you permit to happen to me. Only show me what is your will. Only show me what is your will. Amen. Amen. Wow. Beautiful. That's, that's very powerful. I've, I've actually got uh, goosebumps. You know, you you really do feel that you've called the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, we did that uh, Holy Spirit prayer earlier today, Gary, and I'm amazed at um, what the Holy Spirit brought up in our conversation, you know, and part of it was to do this podcast today, right? Because yeah. we really hadn't had that planned. And so as we were doing that, I said, okay, Holy Spirit, you want to say something, we're we're open to speak, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, Father, you've been recently doing something uh, with the Knights of Columbus. And so can we help uh, our viewers, our listeners, excuse me, I've got a face for radio and a voice for email. Um, so we have listeners, not viewers. Can we talk about uh, what are the Knights of Columbus? Can you give me a little? Right. The Knights of Columbus are a great Catholic fraternal organization founded by Blessed Michael McGivney uh, back in roughly around, I don't have the date memorized, Gary, but it was roughly around uh, in the 1870s or something like that when Michael, Father Michael McGivney was only 30 years old. Wow. And so he was living in, he was a priest in Connecticut and he had a parish and he, he noticed that I mean, he didn't, 
everybody was aware of this, but you know, in those days, a lot of guys worked in mines, they worked in jobs that were dangerous. And so there were a lot of widows and orphans, right? And obviously they were struggling. And uh, not only that, but there was Masonic groups that were trying to pull the men away from the Catholic church and get them to join the Masonic uh, temple. And uh, the thing was, is that uh, sometimes they wouldn't hire Catholics. They'd say, you can only get this job if you become a Mason. Well, uh, it's, you know, the church doesn't allow us to become Masons because it's, it's a pagan thing. And um, so, uh, so Michael McGivney just started thinking about, he says, look, I'm going to found an, a fraternal organization of men that'll be dedicated uh, to living their Catholic faith well. And they'll, and there's also a financial component of it through insurance that, you know, these guys will buy insurance. And so that, that way, if, if one of them has an untimely death, you know, through an accident or work or whatever, then their, their wives can be, and children can be cared for. And so what he did was he, he got together about 20 influential people in the parish he was in Connecticut and they founded the Knights of Columbus. And <clears throat> so now today the Knights of Columbus has 2.2 million members worldwide. And of course the center of it is the United States, but it's in Mexico, Poland, and other countries around the world. And the Knights of Columbus provides this, helps Knights to live their Catholic faith, to be proud of their Catholic faith, to defend their Catholic faith, to defend the Eucharist, promote Our Lady in the Rosary. And so it's a powerful group for doing evangelization. And yeah, so there is a, a trinity right there. You're the Rosary priest. The Knights of Columbus uh, defend the Eucharist and uh, are involved in evangelization. Haven't you helped the Knights with uh, evangelization? Right. I've um, been working with the Knights for a number of years and everything. And last spring, I developed a concept of a of a 24-hour retreat focused on developing the Knights to, you know, to strengthen their their daily walk with the Lord, right? And uh, to live their faith and to grow stronger and their devotion to our Lord in the Eucharist and to Our Lady in the Rosary. So, uh, and then I wanted to connect that with the first and foremost responsibility of Catholics of all ages and uh, is that first and foremost, John Paul II, St. John Paul II says that our number one duty is to evangelize. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? It means to give witness to the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. You know, he set us free from our sins. He's opened the pathway to eternal life. This is good news. And we want to share that with people and invite people to receive the good news and live the good news. So, so I did, I developed a 24 hour retreat called Knights of Columbus power evangelization. Wow. And it's a fun retreat. It's a fun and serious retreat. Um, I call it fun because you get to become friends with some really great saints. And, and it's very serious because in a 24-hour period from 5 p.m. on a Friday to 5 p.m. on a Saturday, 24 hours, in that 24-hour period, we have four talks. We have two hours of Eucharistic adoration. We have confessions. We have Holy Mass. And we have a, a rosary procession all in 24 hours. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, the talks are on, um, the opening talk is on Blessed Michael McGivney because he was just beatified a couple of years ago. Right. And so there's a lot of graces being given through his intercession to help the Knights become even stronger evangelizers. And then the second talk is, it's focused on, uh, the title of it is Our Lady of Guadalupe and St. John Paul II. Um, the star and architect of the new evangelization. So Our Lady of Guadalupe is the star of the new evangelization because after she appeared to Juan Diego and, you know, God miraculously placed her image on his cloak, right? And they built the chapel that she requested the bishop to build. Well, over the next 10 years, Gary, how many Aztec Indians converted to the Catholic faith? I think all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it was about 9 million in 10 years, yeah. which is... So miraculous, right? So she's really the phenomenal evangelizer, you know, always working 
leading us to her son, Jesus. He's the one giving all the grace and she's um, telling us, follow Jesus. And then John Paul II, I, I nicknamed him the architect of the new evangelization because he traveled all over the world evangelizing. That's what he was doing in all these apostolic journeys. He was he, he was teaching everybody to evangelize. He'd have meetings with bishops in the countries he'd go to teach them to evangelize. Meetings with priests, teach them to evangelize. Seminarians, teach them to evangelize. And he was teaching the lay people to evangelize. And then the young people he t- taught to evangelize, right? He did the World Youth Days where, you know, a million young people would come from all over the world to his World Youth Days because they wanted to learn from John Paul II how to live their faith and then share their faith. And that's what John Paul II was. He had a very deep spiritual life, you know, totally surrendered to Jesus in the Eucharist. He had consecrated himself to Jesus through Mary at the age of 20, according to the formula of St. Louis de Montfort. So wherever he went, he always would consecrate that country uh, to Jesus through Mary. And, And these are key elements, like for our listeners out there, if you want to become more holy and you've never consecrated yourself to Jesus through Mary, get True Devotion to Mary, written by St. Louis de Montfort. It's all about about consecration to Jesus through Mary. And see, what is, in its fundamental form, what is consecration to Jesus through Mary? It's, we go to the foot of the cross and we see Jesus offering himself to the Father. He's consecrated himself to the Father. Well, Mary's at the foot of the cross, perfectly united with him in that one consecration, right? And so she, through her prayer, helps draw us there to be with Jesus so that we can give our life to Jesus through Mary, okay? And when you do that, you become like the property of Mary and you let her direct your life in following Jesus. And one of the amazing things about it is, like, if you're not consecrated and you pray to Jesus, you get X amount of grace, But after you consecrate yourself, you not only get the X amount that you sort of deserve for what you did or prayed, but the Virgin Mary's placing her prayer with your prayer and her prayer draws down a super abundance of grace, right? Right. So even though you and I, Gary, are doing small things because Mary's praying for us and drawing down all these graces, these little things we're doing get multiplied and have big impact. And that's the life that John Paul II lived, you know, he knew that He wasn't the major guy here. He knew that it was Jesus and Mary, and he was totally surrendered to Jesus through Mary. So, you know, within his prayer, you know, Jesus is calling him to travel as Pope all over the world. What did John Paul II? He would always go to Marian shrines within these these countries because he knew that Mary was essential to our work of evangelization. And so it's a very... It's a very beautiful way to evangelize, right? You know, like for all the Catholics out there listening, you're not witnessing to Jesus alone. You're not, you know, uh, going and evangelizing alone. You want to always go with Mary. Let her lead the way. Let her prayer draw down the graces that you need. And and it, and John Paul II is one of our best examples of doing that. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And so there's um, there's Christians out there that aren't Catholic that think that around Christmas time, Mary is a very nice lady. And they also point out that uh, Catholics are worshiping Mary, and that's the furthest thing from the truth, correct? Exactly, yeah. We, we never worship Mary. We honor her the same way we would honor we honor her more than we honor our own mother, but you know, we honor our lady. And, and when we pray, we're not praying. We don't pray to Mary. We ask Mary to pray with us directly to Jesus. And so I, when I'm speaking, I always talk about that. We were asking our lady to pray with us directly to Jesus. When Jesus is the source of all grace, Jesus is, 
is everything for us as Catholics. Yeah. Mary was the first Christian in the first tabernacle, really. That's so, right. She carried Jesus. Yeah. So uh, she's more than a very nice lady. Um, I would say to our listeners, if you go to Washington, D.C., you've got to go to the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, which is a yes. pilgrimage site. And about a half a mile from there is the John Paul II Center. And I think you need to go in there and go into the chapel. And there's a first class relic of St. John Paul uh, exactly. the Second, And it, it will give you you, uh, goose flesh, both of those sites. And if you can go to Mexico City, go see Our Lady of Guadalupe. And yes. uh, we could t- we could have a whole podcast just on Our Lady of Guadalupe. But exactly, I- like one thing I'd interject here, Gary, if some of our listeners are, if the Holy Spirit's giving you ideas of some some kind of little apostolate to do in your parish or whatever, and you're trying to figure out how to get it going. Make a little pilgrimage to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City and give the project to Jesus through Mary there because you will find uh, your apostolate will grow. And And I think um, recently they examined, uh, I think it's called a tilde or what? Tilma. Tilma. Yeah. They um, researched the tilma with a... um, powerful microscopic uh, microscope and in her eyes you can see the bishop uh, exclaiming with amazement at the roses that came out so exactly and not only uh, amazement at the roses but when Juan Diego brought those roses that Our Lady had told him to go pick at the top of Tepeyac Hill, when he brought those roses to the bishop, he unfolded his tilma, the roses in December. This was December. You don't have roses in December. They fell on the floor, but instantaneously the miraculous image of Our Lady appeared on the tilma. And so that bishop dropped to his knees, right? And shortly thereafter, the chapel was built. Yeah, no, it's a it's amazing, amazing thing. So I think uh, a twenty four hour um, retreat with the Knights of Columbus, you can export that anywhere in the country for the Knights, correct? Right, right. Yeah, I'm very open. You know, I have permission to travel, and uh, because we've got this boiled down to a twenty four hour retreat, when we do it here at Our Lady of Corpus Christi, each knight can choose to either stay overnight, you know, at our at our retreat center. Or they can do it commuter. You know, they come for the evening, for the dinner, and uh, the two talks in the hour of adoration on Friday. Then they go home and come back the next day for morning prayer and, uh, you know, two more talks, adoration, confession, and holy mass. And then the, we complete the afternoon with the rosary procession. But So this can be easily exported, you know, around the country uh, because I've thought about it a little bit, Gary, you don't actually even have to have a retreat center to do this because if if you have a parish where the priest, you know, is open to it and he has a, you know, a day chapel as well as the big church, you know, you can do the adoration in the day chapel, right? And that kind of thing. And, and then that way it even makes it even more easy. Like you could have, you could have a lot of, uh, uh, Nights all over the country be sp- sponsoring this retreat, right? Yeah. So okay, so they can the Knights of Columbus can contact you through Our Lady of Corpus Christi, and all they have to do is Google that, and they can find uh, Father Jim Kelleher, the Rosary P- Priest. Right, and uh, if you if you've got a good memory, um, my email is Padre J M K. So the word Padre and then the initials J M K at yahoo dot com. Awesome. So, so that's Padre JMK at yahoo.com. Super duper. All right. And also, you're the rosary priest, and the Knights of Columbus are involved with the rosary. And the rosary is a beautiful prayer. A lot of people don't understand it, uh, that we we follow the life of Christ from uh, conception to uh, resurrection through the mysteries and uh, the Hail Marys that we say are the timing piece for which to reflect on these um, mysteries. So, so uh, I was fascinated with the rosary, and then I met the rosary priest and uh, became deeply involved in the rosary, and uh, Father Kelleher and I are trying to get corded rosaries to the men and women uh, in uniform and their families worldwide. And um, I've connected us with the Archdiocese of the Military Services, and so... Um, tell me, tell us, give us a little quick deal on the rosary there, Father. Okay, well, uh, 
St. John Paul the Great said that the rosary is his favorite prayer. He loved to pray the rosary, prayed it multiple times a day. And he liked to say that when we pray the rosary, we're contemplating the face of Jesus and the life of Jesus through the eyes of Mary. So, as you said earlier, we walk through the life of Jesus, his conception in the womb of Mary, and we see God's love for us by sending his son to be born of a woman, right? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, received his human nature from Mary. And he received that human nature when Mary said yes. So we see Mary's obedience at work, right? Each one of us have a mission, Gary, in life. And each day we're called to say yes to what God's asking of us. And see, if we're praying the rosary, we follow Mary's yes. So as we pray the rosary daily, we're receiving grace to say yes to what God's asking of us. And then, you know, you go through the whole life of Jesus and, you know, you just think of his, um, the sorrowful mysteries, you know, his agony in the garden, his scourging at the pillar, carrying of the cross. You know, in our lives, we, we do have a cross to carry, but we don't carry it alone. You know, we're able to carry it because Jesus is helping us to carry it. And so, You know, we're praying the rosary, learning to be obedient like Mary. We're praying the rosary, learning to persevere like Jesus did, carrying his cross. And then, you know, we contemplate the resurrection of Jesus. Gary, I'm really encouraging all of our listeners today to do do these two things. One, read chapter 20 of John's gospel, which is all about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, How he... how. Mary and the women go to the tomb and find that his body isn't there. So they run to get the apostles. And so Peter and John come and they look and they see. And John says he stepped into the empty tomb and he believed. But then the apostles go back to their upper room where they are staying. And Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, right? And what does he say to her? He says, do not cling to me for I have yet to, I am, but go tell my disciples that I'm, I'm going to I'm going to my father and your father to my God and your God. In the resurrection Jesus conquers sin and death and he tell he reaffirms that you know God is our father, right? And God is calling us to this deep life with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We're called to live that life right now. We live it through our baptism and receiving Jesus in the Eucharist and the other sacraments so that you and I are are dwelling places of the most holy trinity that's sort of amazing gary right we, we the most holy trinity dwells in us you know as human beings we have great dignity and you know god created of it, created us so he in creating us he created a, where, a way to care for all of us right so You know, there's doomsday people out there all over the place saying the world's going to end, man's going to make himself extinct, you know, through all this different things. Well, none of that isn't going to, I mean, we're not going to make ourselves extinct if we follow God's plan. If we don't follow God's plan, yeah, we're going to be in deep trouble. You, You can see all kinds of things where people reject God and they're in deep trouble. But for those who follow God, who love God, who let God lead and guide them, even though they have challenges and crosses, they have peace and they have an internal kind of joy. And that's what John Paul II experienced, right? That's what Our Lady lived, right? She was totally surrendered. You know, she says, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. So, yes, Wow, very extremely powerful. And so, uh, Father uh, Jim Kelleher and I are trying to um, get corded rosaries. And the reason we like corded rosaries is they can go through security. They can be left in your uniform and accidentally washed, and they're going to come out just fine, and they're nearly indestructible. Um, in fact, uh, this week we already shipped 100 to uh, our army, our soldiers in uh, the Middle East out of Saudi Arabia. 
So if your church makes corded rosaries uh, and you don't know what to do with them, contact us and we'll, through the Archdiocese of the Military Services, a worldwide uh, diocese, we'll get those corded rosaries to uh, our men and women and their families in in uniform. Uh, Father, who said, and I love about evangelization, always be evangelizing, and if you have to, use your words. So... Uh, that was St. Francis of Assisi, because um, he was a great evangelizer, right? Uh, God called him to found the Franciscan order in about 1208 or something. And at that time, you know, the church was in deep trouble. You know, the people were focused on luxury and things like that. And God called this little poor man to found an order, you know, really dedicated to Jesus on the cross and to living, to living the evangelical poverty and to knowing the joy of the Lord. Because in evangelical poverty, Gary, we recognize that everything we have is from God. And so we can freely receive from God and freely share with others from God. So when you're living evangelical poverty, you're not, you know, hanging on to material things. You're using them for the glory of God and sharing them with the others. And so um, people were super impressed with Francis and they say, how do you evangelize? And he says, well, the first thing to do is, um, let's say that phrase again was... Uh, always be evangelizing and if you have to, use your words. Yeah, always be evangelizing, but if you have to, use your words. So first we evangelize through our what we do and how we witness and then... We add our words as the Holy Spirit inspires. And, and I think that's perfect if you're a parent out there, your little sponges that uh, are in your life, they're watching you. And so yeah. if you live a life that's evangelizing, you don't have to use uh, a lot of your words. words. And I think that also, that phrase eliminates the fear to people. If you go, I, I want to evangelize, but I don't know how to. We'll lead your life in a way that people say, what is it that he has or she has? I want it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Because when we're following the Lord, there's a kind of there's a kind of inner peace. There's a kind of joy that we have. You know, there's a kind of a light that shines through us. And like you're saying, people see it and they want to know, wow, why does that guy have that joy? Why does that guy move forward in a positive way when other people are, you know, giving up or you know, getting very despondent and stuff. Yeah. Um, I was just at a mass with uh, Archbishop Brolio of uh, the Archdiocese of Military Services, and he talked about prayer and where everybody's always praying for a request, a petition, Lord, heal me, Lord, give me, Lord, do this for me. And he said, don't forget that half your prayer needs to be, thank you. Thank Amen. you. So it was very powerful at that mass. I started, uh, thank you for my wife. Thank you for her mother. Thank you for my children, my grandchildren. Um, so yeah, when you pray, don't forget to uh, give thanks. And then, uh, so I also want to, the story about um, Bishop Byrne, who was on a radio, morning radio talk show. And he said, uh, was asked, how do we solve the problems of the world today? And he said that, um, you know, we've we've tried to replace God with cars, with houses, with money, with sex, with alcohol, with drugs, with you name it. And uh, with all those things, people aren't any more happy. And that if you really want happiness, you know, put God back in your life because um, we've all seen it. I'll be happy if I just get this job promotion. You get the job promotion and you're still the same. So whether you're the uh, young man in a wheelchair who's seeking spiritual direction or an executive. If you put God first in your life, you're going to uh, be happy. So Amen. Father, why don't you wrap us up here and uh, any last comments and maybe for all our listeners, you can give us a, a blessing. And sure. does that count if it's on, if a blessing is on a podcast? It does. It all does. Right. Yeah. They'll receive the blessing as they listen to the podcast. Yeah, so as we wrap this up, I sort of just like to point to Mother Ther St. Mother Teresa, who really was the great shining light uh, for the 20th century in so many beautiful ways, because she totally surrendered to God, consecrated herself to Jesus through Mary, and answered God's call. God was the one who called her to go 
serve the poorest of the poor, in, initially in the slums of Calcutta and then throughout the world. And in doing so, God called her to found the Missionaries of Charity, which today numbers about, after about 70 years, numbers 5,000 nuns. It's a phenomenal story. But um, I'm bringing her up because uh, today is November 24th and November 27th is the Feast of the Miraculous Medal. And uh, everywhere Mother Teresa went, she gave away miraculous medals. And I actually was studying in Rome and she'd come through there to visit her sisters and I happened to meet her twice and she gave me two miraculous medals. But she understood that when you give someone the medal, the Virgin Mary prays for them and miracles and conversions happen. And so I just want the readers or the listeners to think about this little four foot, 10 inch nun dressed in a simple white, uh, blue and white habit, you know, going all over the world uh, to bring the light of Christ. And so all of you listeners out there, go online, go to the Miraculous Medal Shrine in Prairieville, Missouri, get a hundred Miraculous Medals for 10 cents a piece. That's $10. They arrive postage free at your front door. And just begin to share the medal and share the light of Christ with your family, your friends, and with strangers. So now I'll give everybody a blessing. Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift of... Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us on the cross, who has set us free and opened the pathway to eternal life. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who has revealed to us, Father, your face, and has revealed to us, Father, your mercy. And we ask you, Father, to pour forth your mercy upon all of our listeners. And we ask you, Father and Jesus, to pour forth the Holy Spirit upon all of us, to sanctify us, set us on fire with love for the Most Holy Trinity. Set us on fire with love for our family. Set us on fire for love of all those in need. And may Almighty God bless each one of you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God bless you. Again, Father Jim Kelleher, Order of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And he's my number one downloaded guest on the Admiral's <laughs> Almanac. And one final point, you can get your miraculous medals at amm. Dot org. So that's Association of the Miraculous Medal dot org. Look for the uh, Miraculous Medal that says 25 cents. But if you buy 100, they're only 10 cents a piece. So uh, God bless you. And thank you once again for being on the Admiral's Almanac. What a powerful conversation with Father Jim Kelleher, the Rosary Priest. As we approach Christmas this year, please share this podcast and its valuable message of Mary of evangelization of the rosary. Again, thank you for listening to the Admiral's Almanac. And until we meet again, here's wishing you a happy voyage home. The Admiral's Almanac is available wherever podcasts are sold. Again, thanks for listening.